Wednesday night uh, Advent service. And tonight we will be celebrating the commemoration of St. Nicholas. And we will be doing this evening prayer with service of the light. If you would please take a look in, on page 5 in your bulletins. During this psalm, there are places where the congregation sings and then also where I will be singing as well. I'll be singing the one and two parts if everyone else can sing the parts labeled C for congregation. Please stand if you are able and face the cross. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening. Let your light scatter the darkness. Joyous light of glory of the
incense of our repentant prayer ascend before you, O Lord, and let your loving kindness descend on us that with purified minds we may sing your praises with the church on earth and the whole heavenly hosts, and may, that may glorify you forever. Amen. We sing together, comfort, comfort, ye my people. reading will come from Isaiah chapter 57. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite. For I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry. For the Spirit will, would grow faint before me, and the breath of life that I made. Because of the in, in, iniquity of his unjust gain, I was angry. I struck him. I hid my face and was angry. But he went on backsliding in the way of his own heart. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will lead him and restore comfort to him and his mourners creating the fruit of the lips. Peace 
peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. O Lord, have mercy on us. A reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Blessed be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope is for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share it and share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, of the affliction we experience in Asia. For we were utterly burdened beyond our strength, that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely on ourse- not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. And our last reading tonight comes from Matthew chapter 5. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. O Lord, have mercy on us. In many and various ways, God spoke to the people of old by the prophets. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit. This is a countercultural teaching in our time and also in the time of Jesus. It is especially difficult for Pharisees who believe that they are good enough, certainly better than other sinners. In Matthew 9, Jesus teaches, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. He then assigns the Pharisees to go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came to call the righteous, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. To understand their need for a Savior, the Pharisees need to recognize that they are poor in spirit. They need to despair of saving themselves from sin, death, and hell. Only then will they understand why it is vital that the Messiah comes to fulfill all Scripture. In his kingdom, God the Father fills the poor in spirit with every grace and blessing for eternity. But for the church to know this teaching, God needs workers in the harvest field. So he sends out protectors of the faith in order that we may hear the gospel of our Lord. Today, December 6th, we remember St. Nicholas who died in the faith on this day in 343 A.D. in Myra, which is today modern Turkey. Since the 9th century, Christians commemorate Bishop Nicholas, who was known for his generosity and the defender of the Christian faith. In today's secular culture, St. Nicholas has been transformed into this mythical figure. He's said to be living in the North Pole. 
where he and his elves make toys and his wife bakes delicious cookies. And somehow he delivers gifts to little boys and girls around the world while flying his sleigh powered by magical reindeer. Regardless of how you express this figure in your home, the man Nicholas, Bishop of Myra, was a true living person who is known for helping the needy and protecting the Christian faith. According to one legend, Nicholas helps a poor father with three daughters. Since there is no money for dowries, St. Nicholas slips three money bags through the family window, and before the bags could hit the floor, they roll into the stockings of the daughters that are drying in front of the fireplace. This is why some cultures, people leave their shoes out for money on December 6th, and others hang stockings by the fireplace during Christmas. There is also a tradition to give oranges as a gift because they look like the three golden sacks or the golden balls that St. Nicholas gave to the three daughters who were in need. He is also known as the patron saint of those who are traveling on the sea. Another legend has St. Nicholas making a pilgrimage to the Holy Land to walk the places where Jesus walked, to see the place where Jesus was hung on the cross, and to see the grave where Jesus rose from the dead. On the voyage home, however, St. Nicholas's ship is caught in a violent storm. While the crew is terrified, St. Nicholas remains calm and prays to the Lord to save the ship. To the crew's amazement, the storm is immediately quieted down and they arrive home unharmed. The last legend is the best documented and takes place during the time of the Roman Emperor Constantine. After 313 AD, Christianity is finally tolerated and even protected by the Roman officials. However, because of the earlier persecution, the church is spread out and not well organized since they spent 250 years worshiping in secret or living as outcasts to avoid being killed for their faith in Christ the crucified and risen Lord. Because of this dispersion of the church, many pastors of this time are influenced by theologies and philosophies of other cultures that do not believe in the one true God. One of these men, who not only is led astray, but leads an untold thousands of other Christians astray, is the heretic Arius, who is a priest from modern-day Libya. This man preaches that Jesus was not born true God, but that through his obedience to the Father in heaven, he became God. Therefore, he is lesser to, not equal to the Father, and this heresy has a great effect on how one reads the Bible. If God did not send his true son to die for the whole world, then what sacrifice did God the Father really make? In order for mankind to be saved, God cannot sacrifice just any man, nor can he sacrifice just a man that is partially God. All his glory needs to be spilt out to atone for all sin. All righteousness needs to be fulfilled for us to be saved. If this didn't happen, the wrath of God would still be against all of us poor in spirit. A few years later, in 325 AD, Emperor Constantine convenes a church council in the Greek city of Nicaea to unify the church under one doctrine, under one confession, particularly the understanding of who Jesus is. Present at this council are 318 bishops of the church, including St. Nicholas. Arius' teachings are declared false, and he is later proclaimed a heretic and excommunicated from the church. The bishop of Alexandria, Athanasius, is a key player in cross-examining Arius and his followers. Athanasius, along with St. Nicholas, and other loyal bishops to the faith, 
fought for a creed that the church could confess in unity. This creed we know today as the Nicene Creed, which confesses the pinnacle points of Scripture, primarily the life and works of Jesus. Arius refuses to denounce his heresies and promises to keep preaching his lies. As Jesus expresses righteous anger at the temple, legend has it that St. Nicholas loses his temper at the council and punches the heretic in the face. Of course, this is not how a bishop, let alone a Christian, should react in defiance against evil. God will take care of the false prophets. After being put in jail for a time, Nicholas repents of his outbursts and is reinstated as Bishop of Myra. St. Nicholas and other Christians who suffered the faith within a wretched world passed on the light of pure scriptural doctrine to us Christians today. God stated, started this handing down of the faith with his apostles who were instructed to go out and make disciples of all nations and deliver the teachings of Christ. The church is certainly rest asunder by schisms today, but without protectors of the faith, such as St. Nicholas. The church would be even more split up due to, its heres due to heresies. In our world, many claim to teach about Jesus, but it is only in the true church where Christ presents himself through the sound teaching of his word, the baptismal waters, and the Lord's Supper, and where we eat in one confession of faith, one body, one blood, spilt for many, and by which all who are poor in spirit may believe and be saved. Amen. Please stand if you are able, and together we will sing the praises of the Magnificat.
from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. For Matthew, our synodical president, and Kevin, our district president, for all present pastors in Christ, for all servants of the church, and for all people, let us pray to the Lord. For Joe, our president, for all public servants, for the government and those who protect us, that they may be upheld and strengthened in every good deed, let us pray to the Lord. For those who work to bring peace, justice, health, and protection in this and every place, let us pray to the Lord. For those who bring offerings, those who do good works in this congregation, those who toil, those who sing, and all the people here present who await from the Lord great and abundant mercy, let us pray to the Lord. For favorable weather, for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, and for peaceful times, let us pray to the Lord. For our deliverance from all affliction, wrath, danger, and need, let us pray to the Lord. For all the members of Emmanuel Lutheran Church and all the Missouri Synod, let us pray to the Lord. For the faithful who have gone before us and are with Christ, let us give thanks to the Lord. Hallelujah. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Rejoicing in the fellowship of all the saints, let us commend ourselves one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord. To you, Lord. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of an, our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve us. Amen. We will close our service this evening together as we sing hymn 349, Hark the Glad Sound.
just, uh, I think that there are a few more ornaments on our giving trees if you would like to take a look at those. And the, oh, and Pam, you have an announcement? Oh, if you would like to join choir, which I highly encourage, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, please go ahead and join Pam up in 10 minutes. Go in peace, serve the Lord.